Hey everybody, Attorney Sam here. I'm going live today to answer some frequently asked questions. So I hope that you enjoy this. I'm also very happy because I just crossed the 15,000 follower milestone. And so I'm doing this as uh, a celebration for that as well. But we had a number of questions. Uh, one of the questions was, what is your favorite grape variety? And I'm actually gonna give both a red grape variety and a white grape variety that are my favorites because it's really hard to pick just one. But my favorite red variety is Syrah. Many people have seen me post about Syrah, but my absolute favorite is Syrah from the Northern Rhone region of France, and more specifically, uh, Cote Roti, and then also Hermitage. Those are my absolute two favorite red wines. And with respect to white wines, my favorite varietal is probably Chardonnay. A Chardonnay is so versatile, you can do so many different things with it. I like the white Burgundy, certainly. Uh, there's also Australian Chardonnay that I really enjoy, the Lewin Art Series. New Zealand has some outstanding Chardonnay, Kumo River. And of course in California, Aubert is one of my favorites as well. But setting that aside, you can also have the Blanc de Blanc Champagne, which is one of my absolute favorites. And so that probably is what clinches Chardonnay is my favorite white. We also had a question about my travel plans for the rest of the year. Fortunately, since the travel arrangements in Dallas are looking pretty good now, it looks like I'll be able to go to wine country a couple times in the next few months. I'll be going to Willamette Valley in Oregon in early August, and I'm already planning visits for there. They're certainly known for some outstanding Pinot Noir as well as Chardonnay. And that's a great time of year to go because in Dallas, it'll be about 110 degrees, 105 degrees Fahrenheit. But in Oregon, it's going to be very, very nice, probably 70s and low 80s. So that's a perfect time of year and one of my favorite places to visit. Then in October, uh, right after my last diploma exam for the WSET, I'm going to be going to Napa, probably uh, Napa for maybe four or five days or so, the end of October, uh, beginning of November. And so I haven't been there for four or five years, and I'm very much looking forward to that as well. And with any luck, I'll be able to go someplace overseas before the end of the year. That one I'm still working on and still waiting to see which countries open up and how easy it will be to travel to them. But I definitely hope to do an international wine trip before the end of the year as well. Then we had a question about how I'm able to handle all the responsibilities of both an attorney and my, my wine-related activities. That's actually an excellent question because uh, time is in very short supply for me these days. Uh, certainly the attorney work has been very busy. Uh, a lot of the data privacy work, which I spend most of my time on, and also patent litigation. But with working at home for the past year or so, I've been able to save a lot of time by not commuting back and forth, probably 90 minutes a day. And in addition, I do a lot during the evenings and on the weekends. And most of my wine-related work, when I'm not just enjoying it and tasting it, involves social media, such as preparing YouTube videos or posts or, or reels for Instagram. And fortunately, those are the types of things that I can do pretty much whenever, whenever I'm able to squeeze them in. One thing that I've often found to be very effective is to do a lot of that work in batches and to save drafts ahead of time. And so on a Sunday afternoon, for example, I might write up three or four posts for Instagram and record a couple YouTube videos. And then I'll, I'll just gradually edit and finalize those and release them individually over time and spread them out that way. By grouping the work like that when I have a chance, I found that that's worked extremely well in terms of being able to get everything in. Of course, the other thing that I've been doing is the diploma studies through the WSET. That, for the most part, is pretty manageable in terms of my spare time. You have to cram a little bit before the finals, of course. The one thing that's gotten a little bit more difficult is the, the final course, the Unit 3 course, is a lot more work than the others. And so I'm having to be very diligent with my time management to make sure that I stay on track for my diploma studies. Another question I had today, why I use a white wine glass for champagne? A lot of people have seen me post about champagne and I'll never use a champagne flute. The reason for that is champagne has some very complex aromatics from the aging process and you get these autolytic descriptors, they're called. Oftentimes that will be associated with things like toasted bread, biscuit, brioche, things of that nature. Uh, somewhat subtle and delicate aromas. And if you have them in a flute, you're really not able to appreciate those aromatics very much. 
However, if you have them in a slightly larger glass, like a white wine glass, you really get the benefit of those aromas and you can enjoy them. And certainly with a nice champagne, that's very important. If it's something that's uh, a Prosecco or something that's a little bit more fruity, that has more robust aromas, then a, a flute would probably be fine. For people who just prefer the look and aren't as concerned about the aromatics, flutes are certainly fine as well. But that's the reason why I choose a white wine glass because it's definitely better for appreciating the aromatics of champagne. And I have found that one of the things that I really enjoy about wine and champagne is the aromas. And so the aromas are a big part of the appreciation for me. And so for that reason, glassware in general is something that I pay a lot of attention to. So for tonight, for example, I'm enjoying one of my big Zalto glasses because I have a, a Pinot Noir that I'm enjoying. And this is one of my favorite glasses in the world. And so I've been actually drinking a lot more Pinot ever since I bought it, just so that I could use this glass. With the Pinot Noir, you really want a big bowl because that helps you to appreciate the Pinot aromatics. Another question was if I always pair wine with food. The answer to that is absolutely not. In fact, I generally will enjoy wine all by itself and champagne all by itself. Sometimes I'll even eat really fast before I start to open the wine, just so I don't have to worry about pairing the wine. Typically when I'm doing a food pairing, it could be one of a few different things. It could be that I'm at a restaurant and I certainly want to enjoy wine at the restaurant or I'm at a dinner party and, and they would expect me to be pairing the wines. Or if there's a wine that I don't think is very good and it's kind of mediocre and it needs to be elevated, then I found that food pairings is oftentimes a good way to elevate the wine. For example, I'm not a big fan of oaky Chardonnay, even though I do enjoy Chardonnay. However, if you have lobster, or certain types of shellfish, then it's actually something that actually pairs pretty well with an oaky Chardonnay. And so that's a way that I've actually used those up is through a food pairing. And certainly when I'm drinking higher end wines, I tend to appreciate those most on their own. And I find the food distracting. The other thing I've noticed is that if you're trying to pair the wine with a certain course, people will tend to drink it more rapidly and they'll worry about finishing it before the next course comes because they'll be getting refreshed on that when that course arrives. And so I think that oftentimes is a way to probably consume the bottle before you can fully appreciate it. Many of these high-end wines actually change and evolve over the course of two and three hours. And so when I'm at a tasting one night, it's not at all uncommon for me to have eight to 10 glasses in front of me, each with a little tasting pour, and then to just revisit them and have a little sip out of each one over the course of two, three, or even four hours. And it's really remarkable how much they can change over that period of time. On Friday of last week, for example, we had a burgundy. At first, we were wondering if it had some heat damage because it, it kind of had these scorched earth aromas and it just wasn't very pleasant compared to some of the other wines we were enjoying. Uh, most people actually just finished it early so that they could get another wine in their glass, but there was one or two people who were pretty smart and they just set it off to the side and grabbed a new glass. And then three hours later, we came back and we checked on it and that thing had transformed remarkably and was one of the better wines of the course of the night. But unfortunately, most of the people had finished it and so we just ended up having to take a little bit of a taste from his glass. That's just one of the reasons why I don't enjoy pairing high-end wines with food and tend to have more everyday type wines that are good pairings and certainly good wines but not, not the type of a legendary wine that you would have for a special occasion. Another question is, what is my favorite wine that's under $100? Uh, if you're talking about a red wine, one of my absolute favorites is from Gigal in the Northern Rhone, and that is the Chateau d'Ampuy. You may have heard of the La La wines, like Gigal La Moulin and Gigal La Landon, but this wine is wine that doesn't make it into those wines, but it's from the same region but it costs about one fifth of the price. So you can typically get this wine for around $100, sometimes maybe 110, but if you find this one, I would definitely recommend getting that one. It's one of my all time favorites and it's a steal in my, value, in my opinion for the value you get at around $100. If you're talking about a wine around $40, one of my favorites is the Protatori del Barbaresco. That's an excellent value and that one you can get probably around $40. So that's when I tend to buy year in and year out. And I saw Nick Sam, Philippe Andre join a little while ago. If we're talking about champagne, it's really hard to beat the value you can get from Charles Heidseek. And so that's actually one of my favorite values for champagne at all price points. Let's see, we've got a question here. 
when doing a tasting of a different types of wine, what to use to reset or cleanse your palate? That's an excellent question. Uh, we actually just had this come up on Friday as well. So we had a Burgundy tasting and we had uh, tasted Burgundy for probably an hour and a half or two hours. And then we had pizza delivered. Again, the, the rest of my group doesn't like to pair the high-end foods with, or the high-end wines with foods either. And so we just wanted to take a pizza break and make sure we had some food in our systems. But we did that. And then we actually opened a couple of bottles of champagne and we had some champagne as a palate cleanser. That works really well because it has high acidity and it does a really good job of cleansing your palate. Then we have a question, what is the most expensive wine I've ever tasted? The answer to that is the 1990 Domaine de la Romani Conti, Romani Conti. That was easily the most expensive wine I've ever tried, and it actually lived up to the billing as well. While it wasn't a 100-point rated wine, it was easily the best wine that I've had, and it probably blew away all the other 100-point wines that I've had. So there's certainly some others that were outstanding, but this one was head and shoulders above the rest. There's something really special about some of the super high-end Burgundy, like uh, DRC. Even though it's Pinot Noir, and the fruit is really, really elegant and ethereal, it's also incredibly concentrated and intense. And so it's really, really hard to explain, but you just take a little taste and then it just explodes on your palate like really nothing else I've ever tasted. It's really, really something special and something that has to be actually experienced to be believed. The same is true for some of the others like the, the Latash and the Richborg. Uh, we actually had the 1990 DRC Latash and Richborg at the same time. And those were just a step behind the Romani Conti and are also available for much lower prices than the Romani Conti vineyard. So while not inexpensive, they're definitely worth seeking out as well for a special occasion. And these are definitely all bucket list wines that I would highly recommend trying if you ever get the chance to do so. What about dessert wines? Uh, certainly for dessert wines, I've been going on a pretty big dessert wine kick lately. I've had some Sauterne, and I also finished my fortified wine class from WSET. And so I have an appreciation for things like sherry now, things like Olorosa sherry. I've had a bunch of my, my port and my sherries left over, so I've been enjoying those as my schedule permits. It's good for a little taste at the end of the night. And the good thing about those is that you don't have to finish them up the next day. They actually stay good for several weeks at a time. And so that's a nice benefit of those as well. Oftentimes what I like to do is open the champagne while I'm decanting the red wine. Uh, the red wines often need an hour or two, and that way by the time the champagne is gone, then I'm ready to hit the red, gr uh, the red wine, and it's ready to go at that point. You don't have to wait around for it. Uh, one of the things that I find particularly unfortunate is that a lot of people will drink their red wines too soon after they're opened, and while it's nice to see them open up, if you've had a long day of work and you're just opening up a red wine, what I find is that people will drink that first glass or two so quickly that the bottle will go very, very fast. And then by the time that it's actually ready to drink, it'll be pretty much finished. And that's especially true if you're tasting it with two or three other people. So I, I definitely recommend trying to plan ahead a little bit and put your red wine in the canter first and then enjoy either a white wine or a champagne, something of that na nature while you're waiting for it to open up. Another place where this is a, a problem is at an Italian restaurants. Certainly when you order a red wine at Italian restaurants, many of them are very, very tannic, especially if they're probably less than 10 years old. And so oftentimes what I'll do in that instance is I'll even order the red wine at an Italian restaurant right when I sit down to get my, my ice water or whatever else I'm, I'm sitting down to start the evening with. That way, you can get it put in the decanter and it will at least have an hour or so to open up while you're enjoying your white wine or, or other sort of starter cocktail. Because otherwise, even though you're having it with food, if you just start out with something like a, a Barolo or a Brunello and they just pour it, it's going to need at least an hour to open up and you're really not going to get it at its peak. So I definitely recommend planning ahead when you're ordering reds at an Italian restaurant. Yeah, restaurants don't spend enough money on decent glassware. When you go to a B.O.B. spot, the wine... Yeah, certainly that's true at BYOB spots. Uh, many times, uh, my friends and I will take our own stems to the BYO places because that's definitely true. Another thing that I've noticed, I, I even did a YouTube video about this recently, is that a lot of times the, the stemware will have residue from soap or it will have foul odors in it. 
And this could happen even if it's a nice stemware. And so you definitely have to make sure that you check your stemware before the wine is poured in it because there's a number of occasions where I've had to make sure that they swap the glass out, even at very, very nice restaurants, Michelin star places, for example. But otherwise, yeah, I would definitely not hesitate to bring your own stems if you're going to a BYO place, especially if you're taking your own wine anyway. 